Well, good morning. Welcome to our sixth lesson in the mystery of Christ, continuing our study of Baptist covenant theology. Today, much of the material will come out of chapter four in Dr. Sam Renahan's book, The Mystery of Christ. This, the topic today will be the covenant of works. As we think about the, the issue of, of covenant theology, we've been putting together what I've called a toolkit and looking at some terms and definitions and concepts that will help us as we come to the various covenants in the scripture to evaluate them and to be able to recognize the, the similarities and the continuity among the covenants, but also the dissimilarities and the discontinuity among those covenants. So let's ask the Lord to help us as, as we study his word together. Father, thank you that you are a faithful God, that you've made yourself known to us, and that in your kindness and in your providence, you've caused that word to be written down so that we can study it, so that we can better uh, receive it from the generations before us <clears throat> and better pass it along uh, intact uh, to the generations to come. Uh, we pray that you will help us to understand the mysteries of Christ, uh, to see him in all of Scripture, to see him from the very beginning promised to Adam and Eve in the garden and completely fulfilled in the incarnation and the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection and the ascension and the session of your own dear son. We pray that we would see him uh, as he truly is, as he's revealed to us in the scripture. We ask this in his name. Amen. So one of the key points that we've considered, again, as we've sort of built this toolbox, is that covenants are something outside of nature. Covenants are not part of the created order. And in other words, covenants are initiated by God with man. They're not part of the natural state. So as we think about today's topic, the covenant of works, understanding this covenant is foundational in our understanding of man's, or natural man's, relationship to God. Every man is born under the curse of the covenant of works. And the covenant of works begins with Adam. And according to the creation account that we find in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, Adam is not merely created and then created by God and then just left to govern himself. Uh, he's not left indefinitely simply to rule himself according to the moral law with no end point, with no goal in sight. God actually enters into a covenant with Adam. And by means of this covenant, he obligates Adam to obedience, and he promises a reward for that obedience. We will we'll have to apply and use some of those tools that we've been learning about. And, and to understand the relationship between God and Adam as a covenant and particularly as a covenant of works. We've been talking about the difference between a covenant of works, the, the material or the stuff of a covenant of works, versus the material of a covenant of promise. This is a covenant of works. And, and you may already know that even in some Reformed camps, the concept of a covenant of works, particularly with respect to Adam, is, is denied. Some, even among the Reformed, will say there isn't a covenant of works with respect to Adam. And, and the objection usually goes like this. It's, there's the word covenant doesn't appear anywhere in the first three chapters of the Bible with respect to Adam. In fact, the word covenant doesn't appear until God deals with Noah after the flood. So some say, see, there's no word there. The, co the word covenant doesn't appear. Therefore, we cannot conclude that this was a covenant at all with Adam, much less a covenant of works. But there's a fallacy in that term, or in that idea, and, and the, the, the fallacy is known as the word concept fallacy. The word concept fallacy. And what this simply is, is that it's the fallacy that says, because a word isn't present in a text or in a passage or in a section of scripture, then the concept isn't present. Well, we, we can think of a couple of examples, probably off the top of your heads, where that, that's untrue. If, if, we, if we applied that same logic, then we could not say we are Trinitarian people. Because the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Scripture. But surely we would all agree, in fact, 
we, we would say you are a, a heretic with a capital H if you do not believe that God exists in three persons and yet is one God. God is triune, Father, Son, and Spirit. But the word Trinity does not appear. So in a similar way, when we apply the understanding of biblical covenants we have, that we've been looking at together and studying together, we, we can conclude conclusively that God did, in fact, make a covenant of works with Adam, even though the word covenant does not appear. And remember that, that a covenant, at its most basic and, and fundamental level, is a commitment with divine sanctions. So Dr. Renahan helpfully demonstrates for us in this chapter several features, if you will, that constitute God's arrangement with Adam. And when we take all these things together, the, as, as Mark Twain would say, the ungetaroundable fact is we have a covenant, and we have a covenant of works. When we add all these things together, we have a covenant of works. So let's think about these things that, that we need to consider. First, that God's creation of Adam was followed by his placement of Adam in a garden. Sometimes we think about that God just created Adam, and, and the garden was all part of the same, same creation, or, this, or the same created act. But Adam was created, and then God placed him in the garden. Eden was not man's initial and natural location. That's, a, that's an important observation that Dr. Renahan makes. Eden was not man's initial and natural location. And because of the particular features and purposes of the garden, we can conclude that the garden was, in fact, a temple. It was a sanctuary. It was a place of worship. So Adam is created by God. He's placed in this garden, and he's given commands. The place of worship here is the Garden of Eden. Dr. Renahan observes this. He said, there are numerous features of the text of Genesis 2 that mark this out for the reader. Such, meaning Mark this out, meaning that this is a place of worship. This is a temple. This is a divine sanctuary. Such as its eastern designation, its mountaintop location, its rivers, its trees, its precious stones, and its metals as indicators of its temple character. These features do not seem especially significant on their own, but when compared with the way that later scriptures employ the same imagery, one finds that later temples are described in language that draws the image of Eden. Eden was a prototypical temple template from which later scriptures draw their imagery and language. Let's say that really quickly three times. Prototypical temple template. But what we see is the imagery here. Now, if, if, you, if you read in chapter 4, I'm not going to spend as, as much time as uh, Sam does is tracing through each of those images looking at the trees, looking at the precious metals, looking at the stone, the precious stones that were present, um, the hilltop location, all those kinds of things have parallels throughout the scriptures. But when we take all those things together, th this, is, this is imagery that becomes foundational in the creation of the tabernacle in the wilderness and later with Solomon's temple. So further evidence of the temple nature and function of the Garden of Eden is found in the fact that God drove Adam and Eve from that temple as soon as they sinned. And that's consistent, isn't it, with what we find in the rest of the scriptures with respect to God's tabernacle or temple or even his church. Sin is supposed to be driven away. Uh, there is no impure thing allowed. In fact, even when we go to the very last chapters, the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, that's precisely what we find. The entire city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, is a temple unto the Lord. It is his dwelling place. And, and there is no sinful or detestable thing allowed there. So the garden is a temple. It's God's tabernacle. There's a second feature uh, of, of this creation account, of, this, of God's arrangement with Adam, that points us in the direction of seeing this as a covenant. So the first one is that Eden is a tabernacle. It's a temple. It's a place of worship. The second one is that God appointed Adam as a federal head. And we've talked about this idea of a federal head, it's one who stands in the place of everyone who comes after him. And remember, all biblical covenants, covenants have a federal head. Adam is commanded by God to subdue not only the garden, but the whole earth and to fill it. That was, that was one of the commands given to Adam, subdue the whole earth and fill it. This is federal headship. God is placing Adam in a kingly role, in a 
federal headship role by which he must subdue and populate the entire earth. And the New Testament writers confirm this. They confirm that Adam was, in fact, a federal head of mankind. If you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, this is one of the arguments that Paul makes uh, very strongly here. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, see, that's Adam standing as the head of all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. So Paul's contrasting. Here's Adam as federal head of all, man, all natural man. And here is Christ, who is the federal head of all redeemed men. And then Paul says in verse 19, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. There's a federal headship in Christ. Well, later on in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says exactly the same thing again. He says in verse 21, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. See, there's a federal headship of Adam, confirmed by the apostles in the New Testament. So all mankind are represented in Adam. So this points us to the fact that God's covenant arrangement with Adam was, in fact, a covenant. So we have the garden as a temple, as a place of worship, and Adam is placed there. We have Adam as a federal head, but there's a third feature. And this third feature is that God obligated Adam to positive law. He gave Adam positive laws of obedience. Remember, we talked about this early on in our study, the difference between natural law and positive law. Natural law is, is, runs, runs along with the moral law. It's the law that's indelibly written on the hearts of men. It is, it is the law that's universally binding on all mankind, and it transcends all of the covenants because it is related to God's character. It flows directly from his character. But positive laws are assigned to a particular covenant. Adam was given positive law. Beyond the moral law written on Adam's heart, God also gave to him positive law. Now, I, I'm, I'm changing the language here slightly from the, the language that Sam used. Try to avoid confusion. We have positive law, and then Sam also says that, that law works positively and negatively. But he, the, the word positive is used in two different ways. So I'm going to say he's got positive law, and we see that affirmatively and negatively. And here's what I mean by that. Positive law is, is these are things that were, that were given to Adam specifically that were uh, binding upon him and all of his progeny as federal head. And those laws came in, in, the, in the form of shall and shall not. Affirmative law, shall. Shall not is negative. Does that make sense? So here, listen to the command. And we hear... We hear in this command, both the affirmative and negative commands. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely eat. So the Lord gives a positive, an affirmative command to Adam. Work and keep the garden. Negatively, he gives him positive law, don't eat of that tree. All the trees are yours freely to eat, except that one. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's some important words in that affirmative command, work and keep the garden. And what we need to understand is that these are priestly functions. These are priestly words work and keep. And we can confirm that this is priestly language by turning to Numbers chapter 3. In Numbers chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, we read this, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, bring the tribe of Levi. And we know the tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe. The priesthood of God was, was given exclusively to the tribe of Levi. Bring the tribe of Levi near and set them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister to him. They shall keep guard over him. Now take note of those words, minister and keep guard. It's the same words that we saw in Genesis chapter 
2, Adam was placed in the garden and commanded to work the garden and keep the garden. Same Hebrew words. They shall keep guard over him, back to Numbers 3, and over the whole congregation before the tent of meeting as they minister at the tabernacle. They shall guard all the furnishings of the tent of meeting and keep guard over the people of Israel as they minister at the tabernacle. And you shall give Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are wholly given to him from among the people of Israel, and you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall guard their priesthood. But if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. This language is precisely the same. Work and keep are the same Hebrew words as keep guard and minister. It's a priestly function given to Adam. Adam's law of affirmative obedience was to serve and to protect the temple sanctuary of God. He was given a priestly role. He is priest working in the garden. And he was a prophet also because he was assigned the duty not only to hear the word of God, but to teach it and to rebuke those who contradict it. See, this was part of Adam's failure. Not only did he eat of the tree for which he was forbidden, but he failed to instruct his wife. He failed in his prophetical office of teaching her and rebuking her when she erred. But in addition to his priestly and prophetical duties, Adam is also commanded by God to subdue the whole creation and to expand his rule over all the earth. This is a kingly commission. It is a kingly commission to go and to subdue, to exercise dominion. Renanhan observes, Adam was commanded to rule the world, king of a covenanted kingdom. Adam was prophet, priest, and king in the Garden of Eden. So affirmatively, he was commanded to be a prophet, priest, and king. Negatively, God commanded obedience from Adam in the prohibition of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we know this from the scriptures. Biblical covenants have positive laws which exist in addition to natural and moral law. Because remember, covenants are outside of creation. As a created being, Adam was automatically obligated to the moral law of God. And in addition to that, because we're seeing this as a covenant, we see that God also gave to Adam positive laws. Affirmatively, you're to be prophet, priest, and king, to work and to keep and guard the garden. Negatively, do not eat of that tree that's in the center of the garden. There's a fourth feature here, and again, we're adding these things together, and when we add them together, we, we conclude, I think unambiguously, that we, that we have a covenant. And, and we have a covenant arrangement that is, in fact, a covenant of works that God has made with Adam. And the fourth feature is that, that not only did God command obedience, but he also promised a reward. He promised a reward that was conditioned upon that obedience. The reward promised to Adam becomes very plain when we consider the two most prominent features in the garden. So think about this. I won't ask you to close your eyes, but if you were to close your eyes and imagine this garden, Use your imagination. Think about the Garden of Eden. What is the, what is the most prominent feature in that garden? Two trees. The two trees. One, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam is commanded of that tree, do not eat. But there is another tree there as well, isn't there? The tree of life. It's a tree of life. What feature stands out the most? This tree of life. The first tree signifies the perfect and complete obedience required of Adam. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil signifies. It is, it is, it's a sacrament. It signifies that Adam is, is owes to God complete, perfect, total, undiluted, unadulterated obedience to God. The second tree signifies the reward that would follow to him if he remains obedient. Here's the reward. As Dr. Renahan states, it confirmed eternal life and immutable perfect communion with God were not part of Adam's natural constitution. He was sinless and upright, but he was able to sin. He did, right? Adam was created innocent. He was sinless. And yet, that sinless state was mutable. It was changeable. 
and it did change. He did sin. His reward then was confirmed eternal life and immutable perfection and communion with God. And because such a reward is, is so great, Adam was not owed to this at all. Even in his state of innocency, even as God's perfect man, Adam was not owed anything from God, was he? And yet God promised him a, a, an unimaginable reward. He promised him eternal life, sinless perfection forever, and communion with the triune God. And in order to obtain such a reward, the degree and the perfection of obedience had to be complete. It had to be absolute obedience, total obedience, perfect obedience. There was no room here for mercy. There was no room for any deviation. There was no room for 99.9% obedience. So the tree of life was a covenantal symbol. It signified the reward of this confirmed eternal life. It, it signified immutable perfection of his person that was possible to him if he obeyed God. It, it signified eternal communion with God in the very presence of God if Adam obeyed. The Adam was in a state of probation. This is confirmed to us even later in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, we read this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So there is still offered to us, now it's under different terms, it's under a different covenant, but there is offered now to the people of God on the condition of keeping the terms of the covenant of grace now, the tree of life. There is a reward of eternal life, of perfect communion with God, of sinless perfection, immutably so. And then in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So here's a picture, this, this river of life, and next to it, a tree of life. And these, these leaves providing the healing and eternal life for the nations. Now we've seen from our study in the last few weeks, when, when we see a promise of reward that's outside of the natural arrangement, that's on the condition of obedience, we know that we're dealing with a covenant. And when we see the reward promised as a condition of obedience, we know that we're dealing with what kind of covenant? A covenant of works. The covenant of works is stated in terms of if you do this, then you get that. Adam, if you work the garden and keep it perfectly, and if you do not eat of that tree, then this is what you will gain. This is the reward for you. This was a covenant of works. But there is a fifth feature. A fifth feature that makes this, again, we, we look at all these things together, it is, it is unambiguous that we're dealing with a covenant, and particularly a covenant of works with Adam. Not only did God promise the rewards, but he also threatened sanctions upon Adam if he disobeyed. Now remember, sanctions are what formalize covenantal commitments. Sanctions are what formalize a covenant. And the sanctions to Adam in his arrangement couldn't be any more clear, right? What's the sanction promised to Adam? Death. Death. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Dr. Renahan says, if Adam ruptured God's rule, he would surely die. His commission to bring creation to consummation would end in ruin, and the seed he was supposed to bring to glory would fall with him. As goes the king, so goes the kingdom. It was a sanction. Imposed not, upon, not only upon Adam, but because Adam is a federal head, 
that sanction is imposed upon all who would follow him, who would follow after him. So the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil signified not only the obedience required by Adam, but also the sanction imposed upon him for his disobedience, namely his death. Now, we know that it was mercy from God that Adam did not die physically, instantly. And yet, on that day, Adam did really and truly die. From that moment on, Adam and all who would come from him are dead in sin. Under a curse. Dead spiritually and helpless and hopeless apart from God's regenerative work to cause them to be born again. So the necessary conclusion in all this, if we add these five things together, we are dealing with a covenant of works. The fact that Adam was placed in a garden, and placed in the garden was a, a place of worship. It was a temple sanctuary. The fact that God appointed Adam as federal head. The fact that, that God... Uh, obligates Adam to a positive law of obedience. The fact that God promises rewards on condition of that obedience. And the fact that God gives sanctions for disobedience all point us in the direction of a covenant. And specifically, it's a covenant of works. So all these features above advance Adam beyond his natural created state. So the necessary conclusion is that God's arrangement with Adam was a covenant. It was a covenant of works. We think about this. Positive law, plus required obedience, plus sanctions, plus a promise of eternal life conditioned upon obedience. What is that? What could that possibly be other than a covenant of works? Now, what happens? What's lost to us if we say, if we just kind of shrug and say, either this doesn't really matter, or this is all so technical, it's really not worth contending for this argument. Or, on the other side, we say, no, I'm not persuaded. This is not a covenant of works made with Adam. What, what's lost for us? What's the harm? Um, remember when uh, Emily and J. Michael were younger, we, would, we did some, some high school debate. And one of the things in, in, when you do debate, you have to establish is what's called harms. Okay, here's, here's my case. And, and if, if you fail to adopt and accept my arguments, then here's the harm. And either I want to maintain the status quo, and here's the harm if you don't maintain the status quo, or I want to advance this particular policy or this particular action, and here's the harms if you don't. So I want to give to you, what's the harm? What, what's lost to us if we do not see this as a covenant of works with Adam? There are a number of things. Uh, number one, if there's no covenant of works, then Adam is not the federal head of all mankind. If there's no covenant of works, then Adam is not the federal head of, man, of all mankind. And then the consequence of that, number two, is that if Adam's not the federal head, then man really is not fallen. That man is not really dead in his sins and trespasses. Man is not actually separated from God. Man may be impaired somewhat by his own actions, but by nature is not dead spiritually. And that would mean God's just charge against man is removed. So when Paul calls God both just and the justifier, Paul would be wrong if there's no covenant of works. When David confesses, that God is righteous in his condemnation of David because from, from the womb in sin did my mother conceive me. From the womb I was a sinner, and God, you were just in condemning me. David would be wrong in that. Thirdly, if man is not dead in his sins, and if man does not stand condemned in Adam, then there's no need for the incarnation, is there? There is no need for the second person of the Trinity to clothe himself in human flesh and to come and dwell among us. There's no need for that if man isn't really dead in his sins. And then more than that, we end up removing the entire basis 
of the imputation of the righteousness of another. So if, if Adam is not the federal head, if we're not dealing with the covenant of works, of which Adam is the federal head, and his sin is imputed to all men, then we have we've now have no basis to argue that the righteousness of Christ could be imputed to all who believe. So the stakes are high here. This is, this is not something that we ought to view as, as an optional doctrine or a doctrine that is, that is of little importance. It's very important. It's foundational for what we would call our soteriology. How is man saved? How is man reconciled to God? Does God, or does man need to be saved and reconciled to God? If you'll remember, as we went through um, our study of the heretics uh, a couple months ago, one of the things that we saw was a continuing theme. Um, Pelagius, in particular, argued that man was not actually dead in his sins. And that's a conclusion at which you can only arrive if you reject the covenant of works and see that Adam really and truly died and that we were represented in Adam, our federal head. So understanding the covenant of works is crucial. And I remember uh, years ago when, when I got a hold of, of covenant theology for the first time, or maybe better, it got a hold of me, and, and beginning to understand these concepts and, and, and understanding, I had this sort of aha moment that Adam, in fact, was on probation. Because I guess in my mind, I just assumed that what we were trying to do as Christians is get ourselves back to the garden, is get ourselves back to that place of sinlessness, get ourselves back to that place of, of walking with God in the cool of the day. But we shouldn't be satisfied with that. That isn't good enough. What God promised Adam was far greater than that, and Adam failed to achieve it. What God has promised to us through the achievement of Christ is far greater than what we can imagine. A sinlessness, a sinless perfection. Adam and his state of innocency and communion with God is not our goal. I mean, his created state in the initial covenant with God was, was provisional. It was probationary. And we, we want to claim the promises of Christ to glorify us, to make us like he is, to give us new bodies, and to sanctify us completely so that we have have not only the the power of sin in us, we have not even the presence of sin in us. In fact, we don't even have the possibility of the presence of sin within us. What will that be like? To worship God unfettered by the kinds of sins that distract us now, the sins that entangle us. Both the the, uh, kind of what we would consider bigger sins, gross sins, but also the ordinary, daily kinds of idolatry and distractions, selfishness, um, pettiness that that we suffer with that hinders our worship of God. Had Adam succeeded, he would have inherited eternal life, immutable sinlessness, and perpetual communion with God. I'll close with this final observation from Dr. Renahan. The covenant of works was a supreme blessing and privilege, an opportunity for mankind to dwell in blissful communion with God for all eternity. If we depreciate that truth, we will depreciate the depths of Adam's infidelity. Adam did not fall out of bed and bonk his head. He fell from orbit and was obliterated when he hit the ground. If we don't get the covenant of works right, we actually lose the doctrine of sin, don't we? We end up downplaying sin. Say, well, sin is just, I mean, it's, it's error. I mean, it's, it's, it's man being less than he really could be. He's not reaching his full potential. And then we have to know he's dead in his sins in our behalf. Because Adam's sin was so great. And, and I, in him, share that sin. You, in him, share that sin nature. That's how sinful sin is. And if we lose the covenant of works, we lose the sinfulness of Questions about that? Well, that, that was not, if you're reading along, that didn't uh, intentionally didn't cover the entire chapter. I'm going to spend some time next week looking at, now, what, what, what do we do with man in his fallen state? What do we think about man? Now, the Scriptures present to us man in four different states. We're given a fourfold view of man in the Scriptures. And, and so far in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we see man in the first two of those. We see man in his state of innocency as he was created. And we also see man in his fallen state. But then we also will see, as the covenants unfold, we will see man renewed, redeemed. Not yet sinless, 
but regenerated, renewed. And then we will see man in his perfected, glorified state. We see Christ in his resurrected glory and a promise that all of us, if we were in Christ, will one day be like him. So there's four different ways the Scripture pictures man. And we need to spend some time looking next week at what does it mean that man is dead in his sins? What, is, what are the implications of Adam's breach of the covenant of the Lord? So questions about what we did today. Questions about the covenant as a covenant of the Lord. So the question is, <clears throat> what, what harm does it have to our thinking, to our theology, if we allow for the idea of death prior to Adam? Uh, I think in, in, in short, part of, part of the same harms that we've, we've already articulated with rejecting the covenant works as a whole, because you, you lose Adam as a federal head. I think what you lose is the imputation, because if... if Death is a consequence of Adam's sin, and death then is imputed to all men. If you say that death came first, then on what basis is that death imputed to us? And then if there's not a firm foundation or a basis for that death being, the curse being imputed to us, then on what basis is the righteousness of Christ imputed to us? So we lose that symmetry. Does that make sense? Um, we, we lose the, the basis for saying that if we are, we are dead in Adam and yet we are alive in Christ. And that his sinless perfection, because there's two parts of, of the gospel. There's, there's, there's two, two, in, in two basic components of, of the redemption applied to us. One is the forgiveness of our sins, which is great and glorious, but we shouldn't stop there. We also have the imputation to us of Christ's perfect righteousness. And I think that's the part you lose. But you, here's the other thing I think you lose. You, you, you end up doing uh, violence to your anthropology. And here's what I mean. If we think of death as preceding Adam, what we're going to think about is death in only physical terms. But you and I are not merely physical, are we? We are both body and soul. So the, on the day that Adam died, his soul died. Um, and in him, all of us, both body and soul, are born dead in our trespasses and sins. Our bodies are born under a curse that physically we will die. But also, if we are not reconciled to God through Christ, if we are not born again, then our souls will meet what Paul calls the second death. And we will be sentenced to a life of, of misery and torment in hell. But if we, if we say that death precedes Adam, then we tend to think of death only in those physical terms and, and discount the spiritual deadness um, in which every man is born. Right, right. Well, it goes together. We, we are, we are um, Adam was created both body and soul, and those are not to be separated. It's not a natural state for body and soul to be separate. So it is, it is, his death was, you're, you're right, his death was total. And if we say that death preceded Adam, then we, what's that? Right. Correct. Right. Good.
comment is there's no, there's no such thing as, as a little sin. Um, Jerry Bridges uses the term acceptable sins. You know, there's these, these sins that we, we tend to tolerate in ourselves and even others. That, that's acceptable. But uh, we, we get upset more about the you know, gross immorality or, or the, the, big, the big sins. But you're, you're exactly right. Um, and as Sam put it, Adam didn't fall out of bed and bonk his head. He fell from orbit and, and was obliterated. Um, Adam's, if we don't understand the, the glorious nature of the promise given to Adam, and even Adam, in, and I'm, try, I'm trying to put this into words, even in Adam in his sinless estate, that the, the gulf between that and sinless perfection for eternity is still an infinite gap. And what Adam lost is proportionate to the, to the magnitude of his sin. So, yes, we might be tempted to think, come on, it's a piece of fruit. I, I mean, is it, was it really that big? But we have to answer, yes, it was, because this was not an oversight this was intentional rebellion against God. This was looking God in the eye, so to speak. This is, this is, this is worse than. We can see this as, as, with young children. You know, that first time, that two-year-old or three-year-old kind of looks you in the eye and says, no. And as a parent, your blood just boils instantly. It's like instant boiling point. That's just a tiny, tiny illustration of the kind of rebellion that Adam and Eve underwent. This was willful. It was done with full knowledge and understanding. Their minds were far better than ours. They knew exactly what they were doing. This was not an oversight. This was not a, oops, I, 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 I spilled the milk. This was willful. This was intentional. This was wicked. And, and the fall was absolutely proportionate to their, to their crime. Justin, can we pray for us?